Welcome to today's briefing. Let's head over to Israel's beach party where Hamas is demonstrating a new capability. And before we get into it, I want to say thank you to H.I. Sutton and credit to navalnews.com for publishing his story about this new Hamas armed underwater vehicle. They beat me to it, so credit to those guys for doing it first and doing a great job breaking it down. But in this video, I'm going to talk about the same vehicle, giving you my opinion about how capable this Al Assef's armed underwater vehicle is. I'm not fun saying that the rest of the video. All right, so here's a short clip released by Hamas uh, about the video. I've edited it down so that you don't get bored here. But basically, they're just carrying this torpedo-like uh, vehicle with a big mast on top. Take a good look at that uh, mast there because that's important. They put it in the water. They have a little diver on the back, and off it goes. No diver, hands off. It's remotely unmanned, controlled. All right, um, it's called the Al Asef, and so. What I did here is I took a look at the video and I kind of broke down images that had both the men and uh, the, the, the vehicle with it together. And I said, if that bottle's 26 inches, which is the standard scuba size bottle, if it's a full bottle, which it looks like it is, uh, I just put that length against the uh, device and it looks like it's about eight feet long, which if you have four men carrying it, it's probably between six and eight feet long. They didn't look like they were struggling with the weight of the object. So it's probably less than 400 pounds, which would be in line with a lightweight torpedo. Uh, on the back though, take a look above my head here. It looks like they've used cleverly, this is a good thing for them, um, a diver sled. A diver sled is normally something a diver or even a snorkeler would hold on to and have a little propeller in that small cage to kind of pull them through the water at say five, maybe 10 knots. It looks like they have put that on as its propulsion, which is very clever. Um, gotta hand it to them, these are very, in very, very good engineers, you know, they just, they, they kind of bash these things together and they seem to work. Now, let's take a look at the front or the nose of this uh, arm device and you can see the impact fuse there. That does not look like it's very well made at all. It looks like it's a washer with a U-shape hook around it. Man, I would not want to be anywhere near this thing after it's armed. It looks like the slightest brush with the nose is going to set it off. And maybe they built it that way intentionally, but I wouldn't want to be carrying this thing after it's into the water, especially after it's been armed. Maybe they arm it after they get it into the water. That'd be a hell of a lot safer, but you never know. And take a look at the uh, seal that's on the nose cone. So where the nose cap meets the cylinder of this body, there is no weld bead around that, which means one of two things. They've either machined the end cap with threads so they can screw it on, which is highly unlikely because that takes a, a lot of very precise tooling and they probably don't have that in their tunnels and warehouses, or it could be epoxied on, which is far more likely, much easier. The problem with epoxying a an end cap on is once it's on, it's on. It's not coming back off again, you know, unless you implode outside the Titanic. So oh. you know, from there, uh, this is a great shot of where you can see the GoPro uh, and the signals antenna above the waterline. Now here is where H.I. Sutton and I agree is we don't know if the GoPro camera that we see here in this video is actually part of the vehicle itself or if it was just there for recording propaganda perspective for a future video that, that, that we didn't see yet. But we're gonna go with, perhaps it is part of the actual vehicle itself here, uh, but, but you know that we're, we're not 100% sure that. Either way, this vehicle has to stay near the surface during its entire duration so that the antenna is clearly out of the water because the only way that this vehicle's being controlled is via a remote signal that's probably cellular in nature, some kind of Wi-Fi signal in nature. They're not bouncing signals off a satellite to control this thing like they're doing in Ukraine. This is a direct line of sight signal somehow. And that is a huge vulnerability in my opinion. But, and I'll just tell you now, I think this thing is not very effective because of that. The moment this thing starts transmitting, the Americans are gonna know where it is. Israel's probably gonna know where it is. And if they don't, we're gonna tell them where it is. So that makes this more of a propaganda device than an actual weapon, but it exists and it probably works. We'll give them credit for that. It probably does work. Now, let's take a look at it submerged. You can see here the GoPro, which is attached to that mast, is underwater, probably waterproof. Um, so, but normally it's gonna be above the water. Right behind that 
I want you to look at that clear tube. You have what appears to be a wire run inside a clear plastic tube. The clear plastic tube is clearly there to keep it watertight, keep water out. And inside that is perhaps another tube with a wire inside of it or just a wire run with heavy uh, gauge uh, insulation around it. Either way, that's how you communicate with the router and control hardware that is going to control the position of the vehicle itself. So from the wireless antenna that's sticking up out of the water, the signal goes down to where the router is and that controls the speed of the motor. It controls the large control surfaces that you can see there. And of course it has the battery section just forward of that. The battery section is probably the same battery that they used with the diver sled. They wouldn't need to add another one. They could to give it more endurance, but I don't think that they're really looking at endurance with this thing because it appears to me to be line of sight controlled. Therefore, it's not gonna be going over the horizon. And because it's line of sight and all you have is a mass sticking out of the water, you're probably not gonna take it very far so that you don't lose sight of it. Things are very hard to see on a wide plane of water, especially if it's just a very small mast. So I don't expect this thing to be very effective. They probably intended on using something like this if they had a small boat or maybe even divers in the vicinity of it so they could keep close track of it. That's certainly not gonna be happening with Israel doing the patrols that they're doing now. And I'm getting more and more into speculation, so I'll stop. Just know that there's a lot of limitations to this line of sight and the fact that it broadcasts a signal are just two of them. All right, take a look at this. This is the last shot of the video. We see the device accelerating to what may be top speed, but maybe not. My best estimate is that it's 10 knots. Um, if it's just using a diver sled with the weight of the torpedo pushing you know, water out of the way in front of it, 10 knots is probably its top speed. The Why that's important is that this thing is not gonna be chasing down any high speed boats on its own. It's gonna use stealth to sneak up on something and try and get in position to uh, hit you know, a slow boat or just get lucky with a boat that it's in front of. That's, that's the way this thing is gonna be uh, effective at all if they can get it in to a position to, to attack anything. So it's called the al Asef. It is a Hamas unmanned underwater vehicle, remotely operated uh, explosive vehicle. All right, let's head south to the Red Sea where Israel is sailing at least one, but probably more of their SAR warships with the United States Navy. And this photo came out yesterday and uh, had four sources on this say that the Israel SAR warship in the Red Sea with the US Navy uh, was under attack from drone and rocket fire accompanying this photo. So of course I took that and I put it up on my Twitter page and wouldn't you know it, H.I. Sutton contacts me right away because he's a good man, good friend, and says, you know, you got 90% of that tweet right, but one part, and that's a very important part, is wrong. So I took the tweet down right away and I was like, well, what's going on? Uh, the ship did not come under drone and rocket attack. That was some misinformation that some other sources had added to the original report from the IDF, Israel Defense Force, that the ship was in the Red Sea with the United States Navy and they're watching for you know weapons, rockets, cruise missiles coming out of Yemen, but they're not directly targeting the ship here. So. I just wanted to make that correction here in the video in case you saw my tweet. It was only up for maybe 20 minutes. I took it down right away. And what they're trying to imply, if you look at this picture, you see the black areas along the side of the ship. Those are exhaust, diesel exhaust ports for, uh, for, for, for the engines, for some of the engines that are on board. And uh, so they wanted to imply that those were blast marks and they're not. That's just where the exhaust comes out and it stains the hull on, the, on this class of ship here. So just know if you see more reports on that, that this ship came under drone and rocket attack, not true at all, don't believe it, but Israel is sailing with the US Navy in the Red Sea, confirmed. All right, let's take a look at the world. We haven't done a fleet tracker in a while. So credit to United States Naval Institute fleet tracker for this. They make this graphic once a week. I try to bring it to you once a week. It's been a while since we did it. So let's start out in the Pacific way over there where Carl's out running around uh, with the Reagan. Reagan is in the South China Sea, but bouncing in and out of the Philippines there. The American Amphibious Ready Group, they're in port in Japan, so that's accurate. And Carl's gonna be uh, in theater probably by the time you see this. 
So uh, the Pats 4 SWA is the uh, U.S. Coast Guard over there just outside the Straits of Hormuz, making sure everybody's obeying the law over there as they transit in and out of that. And the interesting part begins with USS Bataan and the Carter Hall. The Carter Hall's with the USS Bataan, part of the ARG there. They've been at sea a long time, and they're right um, north of Yemen there in the Red Sea. So they're part of that task force that's watching for intermediate range ballistic missiles that one of them was launched yesterday out of Yemen towards Israel and cruise missiles um, coming out of uh, Yemen as well, going north. And if, as soon as they head north into Saudi Arabian airspace, they're, they're just taking them out. That continues to go on right now. And that's what the Bataan's, one of the Bataan's responsibility is. Now, up in the Mediterranean, just north of them, they have USS Mesa Verde. That's a very important vessel that's there with the Gerald R. Ford. The Mesa Verde is a communication and control command ship, if you will, that can also support special forces and, you know, army rangers, you name it, uh, on and off that ship. And they're probably already performing those missions right now in terms of comms communication, intel gathering, all in real time, and providing usable intelligence in real time to people on the ground. Uh, that's really what Mesa Verde is for, and she's probably, you know, doing that now. Now, the Gerald R. Four that's with her has been at sea a long time, just like the USS Bataan has, and those crews are probably getting a little tired at this point. Plus, the ships themselves are going to be needing maintenance soon. So, we could be seeing both the Bataan and the Ford coming home uh, before Christmas, I would say, just if I was to throw a date out there. With them is the Eisenhower, or the Ike for short. Now, Ike was going to go to the Persian Gulf and may still go to the Persian Gulf because that way we have a carrier strike group physically between Iran and Israel. So any kind of medium range ballistic missiles heading over that way has to come close enough to our fleet. We'll just take those missiles out defending Israel. But since that order was given, uh, Yemen, or the Houthis in Yemen, which is the rebels in Yemen essentially have declared war against Israel and started shooting these ballistic missiles and uh, cruise missiles into Israel or towards Israel, I should say. So it's possible that the Ike will stay or pause in the Red Sea, watch Yemen, you know, maybe, you know, break some hearts and blow some minds away uh, in the process before heading around to the, the uh, Persian Gulf there. Um, if that happens, I don't know who's going to go into the Med. The answer might be, in the Atlantic right now. Could be the George Washington uh, CVN. They're doing some kind of training, perhaps a workup for their, their next deployment right now. If we wanna keep two carriers in theater in the Middle East, uh, it would make sense to have one on the Persian Gulf side and one in the Eastern Mediterranean. And the only way to make that happen <laughs> at sea as soon as possible. So we could perhaps see her in the future coming out. Again, we'll know as soon as it happens. I'll, I'll bring it to you. Uh, some other things going on is the Boxer LHD-6 is out doing some training off the coast of San Diego. Typical training stuff, nothing out of the order there. But we're really watching the Middle East right now because we're in a force uh, turnover period. It's going to happen eventually. Uh, we'll, we'll just see when it actually happens. And who's going to relieve uh, the USS Bataan? Are we going to get another ARG uh, in the Middle East? I would expect so. I just don't know who it's going to be yet. All right. Let's shift some gears back home here because we want to recognize uh, Marine Commandant General Eric Smith. He was hospitalized on Sunday with an apparent heart attack. I'm happy to report that he is stable now. He's in stable condition. So everyone here at Subreef wishes the general a speedy and full recovery. And um, hopefully he can come back to his duties as the Commandant. But in the meantime, the next Marine up is Lieutenant General Karstel Heckel. He's the Deputy Commandant for combat development and integration, and he's taking over the temporarily the duties of the Commandant for the Marine Corps. Now the Marine Corps has got a deep bench and these are some tough uh, hombres, so I'm sure the Marine Corps will be just fine. We just hope that the uh, everybody stays healthy. That's what we want here. So uh, good luck to the Lieutenant General in his duties. And perhaps if the Commandant does not come back, perhaps the Lieutenant General Heckel will take over uh, Commandant. All right, and let's leave you with some good news here. Uh, the Navy Nuclear uh, Power School that's in South Carolina has graduated its second wave of nuke school Aussie sailors for the AUKUS agreement. So those uh, sailors are gonna be operating the nuclear powered engine room on board the Virginia class submarines uh, for us after, after their uh, shore training here. And they'll get some at sea training. And eventually Australia is gonna uh, buy three Virginia class submarines we're now offering 
uh, four and five to them if they want it. So, but they haven't bought the first one yet, so we'll see how far that goes. So this is just part of the United States contribution to the trilateral AUKUS deal is we're training the nukes, we're providing three to five Virginia class submarines, very capable submarines, uh, while Australia is developing its infrastructure and building new facilities for our submarines to visit and stay longer there. That's another thing that we're doing with them. And of course, the UK is building new uh, ship and submarine construction facilities to support the AUKUS deal as they build the next generation submarine over there for the Australians as well. So AUKUS is moving along quite quickly uh, with graduating these sailors. And uh, we love having them on the subs. And I'm sure they're gonna do just fine whenever they have their own in the Aussie Navy. So great stuff. All right, thanks for watching everybody. I hope you have a great weekend and we'll see you next week.